Hello everyone, this is Dr. Ahmed Ergin and today we are going to talk all about low blood sugars. So let's summarize what we are going to talk about today. So we will start with what number is a low blood sugar number. That is a big point that everybody needs to know. Number two is how do you really feel when blood sugar is really low, right? And um, can you also have a low blood sugar if you are not a diabetic? That is also a common question that I get. And harm, how harmful is it really? Uh, like, do you really get harmed if you have low blood sugars, mild blood, low blood sugars, or moderate to severe low blood sugars? How, how harmful it is? We will discuss about that. And what happens if you have severe hypoglycemia? How does it uh, feel? And how do you really treat that? Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, the what causes low blood sugar, because it is something that everybody needs to know to be able to prevent the low blood sugar. And of course, we're going to talk about how to reduce the risk. And uh, one of the things that commonly can lead to hypoglycemia or low blood sugar is exercise. We will talk about how exercise can affect or cause low blood sugar. And we will discuss some about the fear of low blood sugar because once you have a low blood sugar, you may start being fearful of low blood sugar and it can uh, make a big change in your diabetes management. And of course, we will treat how to treat, we will talk about how to treat low blood sugars effectively and quickly. Uh, and we will talk about asymptomatic low blood sugars as well, as sometimes people will have a low blood sugars and may not know it. We will also have a touch base on sometimes blood sugar being normal, but feeling low as well. Uh, so stay tuned and we will dive deep into it right now. So if you are new to the channel, I will just describe what we do here. I'm an endocrinologist by trade and diabetes is my passion. Uh, what we do is we treat patients either in person in our Florida West Palm Beach office or virtually across Florida uh, and New York State as well. So we can do everything and actually better than in-person visits uh, through virtual care including remotely monitoring your blood sugars and staying in touch with you all the time. So we have a different way of practice and these videos are educational and of course if you need individualized care uh, definitely we will be uh, more than happy to help you if you live in Florida or, or New York State. But let's move on to the first topic. What number is really low? Typically uh, we consider low blood sugar less than 70 milligram per deciliter. That's 3.9 nanomol. We have a lot of uh, members from outside the United States. They're sometimes asking about the numbers uh, that is uh, not in, uh, that, 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 that I would say in metric units. So uh, uh, 3.9 would be the, uh, the low blood sugar for that and 70 uh, milligram per deciliter. Uh, but on the other hand, less than 54 is uh, really what we are concerned about. That's uh, really clinically important to low blood sugar. Now, uh, less than 70 uh, is important, yes it is, uh, but it's really uh, not a big deal uh, if you are just having 65 or 70 occasionally. Uh, if you're going below 54, you will really have um, quite a bit of symptoms and it will not feel good at all and it can also cause uh, problems uh, in the body as well. So that's why we consider less than 54 symptomatic uh, and, and not necessarily symptomatic, but clinically important. Uh, just because you can actually have symptoms, even if your blood sugar is at 100, if you are normally running at 300s and going down to 100 sometimes can cause symptoms as well. So how do you feel uh, really when you have a low blood sugar? Uh, well, it doesn't feel good, that's for sure. So what happens is basically uh, your body will go into a panic reaction. We divide the symptoms into neurologic or neurogenic or adrenergic or adrenal induced. Uh, so basically your body pumps a lot of adrenaline uh, as if uh, you are about to die. So it causes a lot of heart racing, uh, sweating, um, panic reaction, excessive hunger, um, uh, shaking in the hands, uh, as if you're losing blood. Same reaction if you were bleeding to death uh, is given by the body, like feeling clammy, hot, uh, heart racing, uh, all that stuff that happens with any panic reaction in the body. Uh, so it doesn't feel good at all. 
Uh, the neurological symptoms could be dizziness, uh, could be confusion, uh, could be irritability, uh, and being snappy. Uh, so if your husband or wife tell you why well, you're having a you know problem with me, you can just say, oh, my blood sugar is low. <laughs> Alcohol, though, you have to prove it sometimes because that doesn't always work that way. But regardless, definitely neurological symptoms can happen. Uh, severe confusion can happen. I have seen people uh, like zoning out totally uh, when they have low blood sugars. They may actually hear you sometimes and they may not even respond. So if somebody is um, not responding to you, uh, don't think that they are insult, trying to insult you or offend you. Uh, just check their blood sugar, especially if they have diabetic, okay? That's, not, that's a better idea. Uh, but those things can happen, especially if, this, if the low blood sugar gets deeper and deeper. Uh, their responsiveness will be lower and lower. And if they're not responsive at all, and if somebody has diabetes, what do you do? You have to make sure that you find glucagon. And if it is a relative or a friend, uh, you should probably know where they are keeping their glucagon, typically in the fridge, but it's not a bad idea to be familiar about how to use glucagon as well if somebody's having severe low blood sugar, which uh, at that point they may not even be responsive at all to you. Uh, so don't try to shove um, honey and sugar into their mouth, that may not be very helpful. Although if there's nothing else you can do, if there's no IV line or, or a glucagon around, uh, then yeah, you have to do something. So putting a little bit of a honey uh, in the side of the mouth uh, can still help, uh, but it may not be very helpful, especially if they have taken a heavy dose of insulin. Uh, you have to better call 911 before losing too much time. Uh, I would say call 911, try to look for a glucagon, uh, put some honey at the same time, uh, do your best, but uh, these are the, uh, the number of things that you should be considering when somebody is unresponsive with diabetes. Um, now, uh, can you have low blood sugar if you do not have diabetes? Yes, you can. We call that reactive hypoglycemia. Uh, that typically happens um, a lot of 10 to 15 years, mostly after gastric bypass surgery or in some insulin resistant patients or pre-diabetic patients uh, or some people who are just just being um, prone to it, uh, especially after a high carbohydrate load. So sometimes they may eat just cookies, bread, or pasta, stuff like that that are high carb, uh, but not a lot of fat content in the food. That can spike your blood sugar significantly, uh, and that causes the insulin discharge, of course. But then since some of these carbs are rapidly absorbed and disappears from the blood, uh, and insulin may still stick around, and that excessive insulin can drop them uh, below 70. So they may start with 80 blood sugar, they may go up to 190, although they are not diabetic, but it can happen, go to 190. Uh, we call people diabetic if they are spiking more than 200 after meals, right? So they may go to 180, 190 after a big heavy carbohydrate load, and then the next thing you know that their blood sugar is actually plummeting down to uh, 60 uh, very fast, and they will feel that, and that's we call that the reactive hypoglycemia. Dietary adjustment is the key, and sometimes we do medication management as well, but the dietary adjustment it generally fixes that problem when it happens in non-diabetic patients. Uh, we discussed about the severe hypoglycemia a little bit, uh, but what causes low blood sugar is, is many factors. So I think that is the most important thing that you have to be familiar with because that is basically what most people do not understand and the patient education is the key. So I'm going to talk to you about a few things that can cause low blood sugar. Uh, you should understand the risk concept. You are at risk if you have certain features for low blood sugars. Low blood sugar does not happen just from a one single thing. It happens from uh, many factors generally coming together. So, if you have a long duration of diabetes, let's say at least 10, 15 years or more, then you're actually losing glucagon producing cells. Glucagon is the main hormone that makes you uh, counteract the low blood sugars. So insulin reduces your blood sugar and glucagon increases the blood sugar. Initially, glucagon is a nuisance uh, because it tends to increase your blood sugar for diabetics, uh, but uh, later on, actually that um, hormone goes away and then you totally lose uh, the um, protection against low blood sugar. So that is one of the problems having diabetes for a long time can increase your risk of low blood sugar. Especially if there's 
other offending factors such as some medications which we will discuss such as sulfonylureas or insulins can make you more prone to ha have hypoglycemia or low blood sugar uh, very easily. Uh, if you're older, uh, that is also uh, a risk factor because as you get older, your reflexes, your response, your panic reaction, everything becomes more dull. Uh, things become slower. Your body does not respond as well. So your blood sugar may be dropping quite a bit and you may not even realize that. The other, on the other hand, uh, in older people, uh, they tend to not metabolize the medications well, so they may occasionally be um, over-medicated or drug interactions can happen, which can potentiate the effects of medications. And again, older individuals do not metabolize the medications uh, sometimes too well. They tend to have more chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, etc. Their organs are not well functioning. Uh, their protective hormones like glucagon or their liver, they're not as good, uh, they're not as robust. So as you, if you're older and you're diabetic, you're again at high risk of low blood sugars. Now, uh, of course, sometimes low blood sugar happens when either the doctors or the patients are extremely passionate about bringing their blood sugars to as low as possible. Well, when you do that and when you try to use everything in the world to trying to reduce your blood sugar, sometimes you are really putting yourself at risk of dropping your blood sugar too low. It's like if you are trying to, if, if it takes two hours from go from A to B, from city A to city B, and if you're trying to make this in, in one and a half hours, trying to save another half an hour, yes, you can do it, but then you may have an accident down the road, right? If you're going faster and without caution, uh, same thing with diabetes. If you're trying to use a lot of medications to try to bring the blood sugar down as much as possible, or you're restricting your diet too much, but you're also taking medications to reduce the blood sugar, then you're really looking for trouble. That is another big factor that you have to balance out. Uh, how much medication you are taking, what's your diet, and so forth. A lot of people go into a diet, uh, you know, like for example, they hear about this keto diet, they say, oh, I wanna do this, and then they don't think about their medications they're already on, and then suddenly the next thing they know is they bottom out because they're taking medications that can cause severe low blood sugars. And th that's why I always tell you guys, always talk to your doctor, preferably a diabetes specialist or, or an endocrinologist so that you can actually modify your regimen if you're going into a diet. Um, again, uh, if you're on, uh, let's say, a sulfonylurea such as glipizide, glyburide, glimepiride, these are the sulfonylureas, or megalithinides that are more shorter acting agents such as um, uh, repaglinide or nataglinide, some people know these as Starlix uh, or Prandin. Uh, these are medications also, although they are pills, they still put you at significant risk of low blood sugars if you do not have a regular eating schedule. So you have to be very careful about these drugs. If you're on them, you have to have a regular eating schedule. Same thing with insulins. If you're taking insulin, I'm not talking about the long-term insulin or long-acting insulin, but oh, I'm talking about the short-acting insulins. If you're taking short-acting insulins for meals, you better eat that meal. So if you're taking 10 units of Novolog or Hemolog or Apidra, uh, and that 10 units will do its job. It's going to bring your blood sugar down. So if there's no blood sugar uh, come in or if there's no carbohydrates coming into the bloodstream from the food uh, there will be no balancing so we typically give short-acting insulins to balance the um, the sugar that's coming from the food right so but if you do not have that then you will definitely uh, go down on um, the blood sugar very rapidly so uh, you cannot just take a short-acting insulin and just forget about the forget about the, your lunch or dinner which happens actually to people a lot, especially if you're at work, you know, uh, things can happen very quickly. If you had a, a previous uh, low blood sugar, uh, you know, uh, it's like having a criminal record. If you had a criminal record, they, they expect you to potentially have another crime. So they watch you, right? So, so if, if you are, if you had a low blood sugar, that's not a crime. I'm just giving an example. But if you have a, if you have a low blood sugar, that, that means that there is something going on that puts you at hypoglycemia or low blood sugar to begin with. So uh, whatever it may be, unless it is totally fixed, 
you are at risk of having another low blood sugar. So that is uh, something that you have to pay attention. Uh, the fear of hypoglycemia kicks in, low blood sugar, uh, fear of low blood sugar kicks in. Once, once somebody have a severe low blood sugar, it's not a good feeling at all. Uh, that is, that's, that's a psychological thing that we have to address separately. Uh, but again, uh, we always pay attention if somebody had history of low blood sugar. Again, the, another big factor is exercise, right? So when you guys exercise, your body starts utilizing the blood sugar like heavily. Uh, so if your blood sugar is normal or mildly a little bit high before you exercise, I always tell my patients eat some carbs. Now, how much carbs? That is generally uh, one gram per kilogram per hour, or like maybe you can say half, uh, half a gram per, uh, per pound per hour. Uh, and depends on the intensity of exercise. And, um, you know, occasionally, though, interestingly, if you're doing a high intensity exercise that can discharge a lot of adrenaline at the beginning, and your blood sugar may actually may go up during the exercise, which follows by low blood sugars down the road in, like, let's say, three, five, six hours later. Um, but if you do not want to actually drop your blood sugars during the exercise, like in the middle of the exercise, you may want to mix the high intensity and low intensity exercise. Uh, so that high intensity exercise will actually, actually boost your blood sugars and low intensity or cardio will try to bring your blood sugars down. So that, that is a strategy, but the most important strategy is checking the blood sugars. You can do a finger sticks if that's what you have. You can, do, you can use your Dexcom G6 or G7 is coming. You can use Freestyle Libre or Freestyle Libre 2 is coming. You know, all those good advancements you can use if you have the means, if your insurance covers it, great tools to help you understand what's going on with your blood sugars. Why Dexcom G6 is so good or, or G7 or Freestyle Libre 2? Because they actually tell you what is about to happen based on the current drop in your blood sugars. So if you are starting your exercise at 150 and your blood sugars are dropping uh, 60 milligram or 90 milligram um, per hour, uh, or depending on the minutes, you know, the, the machine calculates and tells you, uh, shows you, for example, two arrows down, that means that you're going to drop severely. So stop the exercise and eat something before you go down there. So these are the important things that you have to be uh, really, really on top of if you're exercising, which is important. I'm not saying don't exercise. I, you have to exercise. It's just that especially if you're on insulin and certain agents that can drop your blood sugars, uh, you may be at significant risk. Now, of course, guys, you know, there are not every medication is high risk. So uh, you can be on Ozempic, Ribelsis, Trulicity, Bidrian, Genuvia, Jardians, Farsiga, Invokana, Metformin. Uh, these agents are not high risk. Pioglutazone, uh, Octos, these medications are okay. Uh, so uh, they do not really cause any. So but what, what ends up happening in my practice is if somebody is having low blood sugars, I don't just turn a blind eye to it. Uh, so what I do is I say, okay, let's just try to manage this. If we can change our medications to something else that does not cause low blood sugar, let's do it. Uh, we try to find ways to always, always avoid low blood sugar. Why? First of all, it doesn't feel good. Second of all, it causes people to eat more and more as every time they have a low blood sugar, they kind of try to eat more and that causes significant problems, weight gain and so forth, rebound, uh, high blood sugars, uh, all sorts of problems associated with low blood sugar. So our goal in my practice is always, always avoid prevent low blood sugar and find, find ways to do that. Uh, dietary changes, education and medication management is the key when it comes to these uh, points. Now, of course, alcohol is another big factor. Uh, just a glass of uh, wine at night is not gonna really do too much, uh, but if you're uh, going and partying and having three, four uh, shots, uh, you are looking to um, have low blood sugar next morning because you're actually shutting your liver off. Now, liver is the biggest glycogen store, which is glycogen is the molecule that's like a packed glucose together. So uh, the, the biggest glucose depot is your liver. Uh, and when you shut that off, uh, you are basically are totally helpless. So if there is insulin in your system, uh, even if there is glucagon that's trying to save you, like an internal glucagon that's trying to save you, your body is still is going to be non-responsive uh, when you are under the effect of alcohol. 
So, um, another point is the chronic kidney disease. If you have underlying chronic kidney disease starting from stage 3, stage 4, stage 5, you are at very high risk of low blood sugar, especially you, if you're using sulfonylurea and insulin. Again, if you're not using sulfonylureas or megalitonides or, or insulins, uh, you're not necessarily at high risk just because you have chronic kidney disease. Like I have a lot of patients on uh, GLP-1 agents such as Ozempic Trulicity, sometimes Trigenta and so forth, DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, they really don't cause any problems just because the way they work is not necessarily through kidneys. They're not metabolized by the kidneys and um, as a result you, you're not looking for a problem. So if somebody has a kidney failure, we choose the drugs accordingly. We, 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 you know, we look at things holistically. Uh, that's part of being a doctor. So that's why my advice is watch these videos and learn as much as you can about diabetes. But let the doctors make a decision for you. Do not stop and start medications. Do not go on your own to do things to help your diabetes because more than likely you are going to end, end up having a problem associated with it. Now, malnutrition and uh, you know is, is a big factor. Some people just go on a, this crash diets, and that's just not going to help. Sometimes when you're sick and you know you just don't have any means of eating, your appetite is down, uh, you have cancer, God forbid. You know these are the things that can definitely reduce your glycogen and glucose stores, and it may definitely put you at risk of low blood sugars. Now, so uh, we discuss about the risk factors, about how does, you know, lo how, why low blood sugars can happen, what are the risk factors, but then, you know, of course, how to treat is, is the biggest thing, right? So it's actually how to treat is uh, very easy. I call it 15 or 20 rule. So basically what you do is you try to use heart candy or, or glucose tablets, which are proven to be the best. Uh, some people use uh, crackers, some people use juice, uh, regular Coke, whatever. Uh, but you have to be very careful about how much you're ingesting because at the moment of stress or panic, people tend to eat the whole kitchen. It's, so don't do that. So it's, try to stick with your 15 to 20 rule. Basically, you are eating, um, uh, you know, say 15, 20 grams of carbs, which is equal to four glucose tablets, uh, which is equal to half a glass of juice, equal to three to four crackers, um, and then basically you're checking it again in 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so at that point, if your blood sugar is above 70, that's great. If you're going to have a meal, go ahead and have your meal, go ahead and take your medication, you should be all right. Uh, but still monitor your blood sugar maybe at least an hour after a meal. If you're not going to have a meal at that point, even if you're at uh, above 70, I would suggest checking it again at 15, 20 minutes again to make sure that it's staying up uh, or maybe having a more uh, snacks such as uh, something that has protein and fat in it along with carbs so it can actually keep you until the next meal. That is also very important if you have had uh, a sulfonylurea agent such as glupozide, glyboride we discussed, uh, insulin etc. If there is the effect of insulin in your body uh, that is another reason that you have to be really keeping an eye on it. If your blood sugar is not going above 70 after eating 15 to 20 grams of these carbs, uh, then you eat another 15 to 20 grams. And again, check it again in 15 to 20. So that is a cycle that goes on and on and on. So if you are, if you're above 70, great, monitor again, great meal time, you're good to go, uh, but still monitor at one hour. Uh, if your blood sugar is not coming up, uh, keep eating that 15, 20 grams. Um, and at some point, you know, once you're above 70, you can have a small snack with protein and fat and you should be good to go. One thing you should be paying attention also, which is a mistake a lot of people do, uh, is relying on your continuous glucose monitoring system. When you have a low blood sugar, that's not necessarily the time to rely on your Dexcom G6 or G7, whatever it may be. Uh, it's not the time to rely on your Freestyle Libre. So Freestyle Libre uh, or Dexcom G6 uh, is not going to tell you that your blood sugar is up. Why? Because they are delayed. They are telling you the blood sugar in your tissue level, not necessarily in the blood level. So the transition from blood to tissue and then the, the time the sensor detects the, the sugar increase 
uh, all those chemical reactions to happen and, and all that. So in this time of rapid changes in the blood sugars, you do not rely on your CGM or continuous glucose monitoring device. You rely on your finger stick. Yes, they try to, you know, market you those things, uh, no more finger sticks and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's typically, uh, mo most of the time is true. But in the time of like severe situation, like a severe low blood sugar, you're, you're trying to fix it, your blood sugars are changing rapidly, uh, that's not a time to rely on your Dexcom or Freestyle Libre. That's, uh, that's a good clinical point. I want you to remember, rely on your finger stick up, uh, checks at those times. Now, when do we use the glucagon? That's another point that we need to discuss. Uh, glucagon is a time when you don't use it on yourself. Somebody else uses glucagon on you. Uh, glucagon is available in a traditional format where it comes in a powder and you have to mix it and then you have to give an intramuscular injection. Uh, nowadays, uh, there are new formulations where it comes in a pre-filled uh, pre syringe. So all you have to do is just take the syringe out and just jab it into the muscle of that person who's not responsive and just let it run to the system. Uh, also, there is a nasal glucagon, uh, the, the one that's called um, the, uh, the, uh, the pre-filled one, I, I believe it's called Gvoke. Um, it's a good drug, but it's new drug, so it may not be covered by your insurance, but you can always have your physician try, if they're willing to try. Uh, also, the other thing that, uh, that the nasal glucagon is called Baximi, uh, also is available. Uh, again, you know, insurance coverage may not be that great, but your physician, if they're astute and if they are uh, on top of their game, they should know how to get you those medications especially if you have commercial insurance there are many ways of finding coupons copay cards and and stuff like that so for some people that may be an easier thing to do especially uh, as a family member let's say your wife is uh, is diabetic and uh, you're 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 really fearful that she may have a severe low blood sugar but you're afraid of using a, a needle or a syringe that you have never used before uh, in, if that's the case, you may want to try to go for a nasal because all you have to do is just, it's like a, like a asthma medication, you just do two puffs and, and then you're good to go. So, what happens if your blood sugar is low but you don't really feel it? But that happens a lot in patients who have um, blood sugar problems frequently. So if they're having frequent blood sugar, low blood sugar, your body at some point just stops responding. It's like, this is too much. If you're having low blood sugar every day, I'm done. I'm not going to tell you that your blood sugar is low. Uh, I'm just joking. That's not, not the body talks to you. It's just the, this called in, in medicine, we call this down regulation. When something happens repeatedly, your body becomes less responsive to it. Uh, so, uh, so as a result, you know, this is a problem. Why? Because you're not going to realize that you're really low until your blood sugar goes low. So what's the treatment for that? We just tell the people, just calm down. I have a lot of patients who are so obsessed about their blood sugars, they rather live in the 40, 50 blood sugars than, uh, than a 180 blood sugar. I'm like, look, yes, high blood sugar is harmful, but low blood sugar is harmful too. And actually, it can cause you cost you your life. So let's say you're having a low uh, driving, you have a, you have a low blood sugar, severe low blood sugar, and then you pass out. What's going to happen? You're going to kill somebody. You may die yourself. So don't put yourself at risk of low blood sugar. Do everything you can to avoid the low blood sugar. So, but uh, sometimes it just can change people's minds. You know, they they just they're just stuck in what they think they know. And uh, but you know that's something that the, the treatment for that is basically relaxing. The sugars so your body will realize the difference oh yeah now your blood sugar is coming high now when I go low I know I'm going low so the, the, the difference is what your body realizes so you have to give your body a break and let your blood sugars go up a little bit not like in 200s 300s but at least in the sometimes in in the high 100s is going to allow your body to realize that you actually can have a low blood sugar when you're going down to 70 so Anyways, and there are some people who will actually have low blood, uh, low blood sugar symptoms without having low blood sugars, right? So we sometimes treat people and we have very effective medications and dietary modifications and we can bring people's blood sugar from 400 down to 100 within a week or two nowadays, right? And we do that a lot, actually. Uh, and some people love it. They are impressed. They, they love us. Uh, but some people will say, oh, doc, you're killing me because, like, I'm shaking. When I'm, like, down to 100, I'm shaking. And, and they're right, you know. I, I'm not blaming them. If that's the case, 
case, we just relax it. We just say, well, let's just calm down. Let's just bring your blood sugars up, up a little bit to 150, 180, whatever you're comfortable with. And we take it easier on these patients to bring their blood sugars down maybe in the, in the, in the next few months instead of just few weeks. So uh, I do not recommend treating blood sugars when they're down to just, um, you know, 100 and um, you know that's not something to treat it tends to go away your body gets adjusted to it uh, and that is basically what it is and as long as you know what it is you should be good to go again guys this is dr ahmed ergin i hope that uh, lecture was helpful to you i think every diabetic should know about how to deal with hypoglycemia and low blood sugars uh, what puts them at risk and if they are at high risk medications and they are having low blood sugar, they have to discuss with their doctor. Again, if you're in Florida or New York, uh, we are definitely available. Uh, just call us, um, give us a thumbs up for this video, uh, and we are going to bring up more and more videos. Please support us, subscribe, share these videos uh, so that everybody can benefit from it. So again, we'll see you in the next video. Have a wonderful day.